So first of all, thank you for taking the time and yeah, now is working. Thank you for taking the time and the interest to attend our talk. Uh, yeah, my name is Sandro Pinto. With me today, I have uh, Jose Martins. Uh, we are from uh, Academia, but we are the founders and main maintainers of this BAO open source hypervisor. And uh, the title of our talk is the porting. Not really. One, yeah, now it's much better. Yeah, I think you understood the first. I don't need to repeat everything. Uh, yeah, and uh, the title of the talk, the title of the talk is "Porting a Static Partitioning Hypervisor to ARM's Cortex R52," uh, and this static partitioning hypervisor is is BAO. Uh, the agenda for today is this one. I, I will start with a, a brief introduction just to, to provide some background about virtualization, mixed criticality systems, and IoT, and uh, the rise of these static partitioning hypervisors and the motivation. Then I will be briefly uh, present the, the BAO hypervisor, an overview and some few highlights. Then I will hand over to José, which will explain or provide the motivation, implementation, and the challenge of BAO on this particular uh, novel architecture from ARM, which is the Cortex-R52. Then we will perform a non-stage live demo. Uh, we hope we don't run into the same troubles as the previous presenter. Uh, and then uh, we will just touch on takeaways and, and, and future work. Well, virtualization is a, is a quite broad technology that is around for several decades, and it basically allows the execution of multiple operating systems into the same platform. Uh, a kind of analogy is that an hypervisor or virtual machine monitor is to an operating system what an operating system is to a process of, or a task. Well, the main functions are research management, abstraction, and protection and slash isolation, and uh, Basically, virtualization is well established for quite some decades in cloud and the server space. Uh, and there are typically two types of uh, hypervisors, type one or bare metal, which is represented below, where the hypervisor runs directly atop the hardware platform. Uh, and on the upper side, we have this host of type two hypervisor, where typically the hypervisor or the virtual machine monitor runs atop the operating system. Well, uh, virtualization started the shift uh, a few years ago from the cloud or the server space also to embedded and mixed criticality and IoT applications. We have here four market segments that have been using uh, these virtualization concepts. For example, in automotive, the consolidation of the infotainment system with uh, some uh, safety critical uh, control systems, like for example, uh, the brake pedal. Also for the medical industry, for drone applications, but also in, in industrial control uh, systems where you right now, for example, want to perform some control logic to basically move the, arm ro the robotic arm, but at the same time you want to have a very nice UI or interface and with connectivity uh, support that you can, for example, from China, control your robotic arm, for example, in Europe. Well. But embedded virtualization has different requirements from the virtualization that we typically, or the requirements for virtualization that you typically see on, on the cloud and the server space. Uh, on one side, yeah, it provides this sort of consolidation that typically uh, alleviates what is called the swap C, size, weight, power, and cost to reduce. Uh, at the same time, uh, in embedded virtualization, we want, uh, yeah, uh, don't, we don't want much performance overhead. What, what typically ends up in leveraging as much as possible the virtualization support, the hardware virtualization support available on the platforms. But at the same time, uh, you typically use this this technology for also called mixed criticality systems, and you need to provide these uh, safety guarantees or temporal, uh, special and temporal, in lack of uh, freedom of uh, interference or temporal and spatial isolation, typically to comply with uh, safety standards, like for example in the automotive industry, the ISO 26262. At the same time, as I explained before, you have this 
control logic loops. So these control logic loops as these strict deadlines or timing uh, requirements, we translate in these real-time guarantees. And nowadays with this ongoing connectivity trend within the IoT, uh, you don't want like hackers or attackers uh, from the outside to basically uh, broke down your system. So uh, nowadays in this sort of applications, there is no safety without security, that's why, it, and vice versa, and that's why you need the security aspect as well. Well, in terms, just to provide a brief, a brief overview of, uh, among the hypervisor spectrum, on the left, completely left side of the spectrum, you have this traditional server-oriented, uh, cloud-oriented hypervisor, which typically have a large code base, most of them depend on Linux as part of the trusting computing base, but they are completely fully featured uh, in terms of the features that uh, supports to target uh, a very broad spectrum of applications. Uh, but they typically provide some high overhead in terms of I.O. due to the use of uh, techniques like uh, emulation or power virtualization. And uh, yeah, typically is, uh, the preeminent examples in terms of open source is the KVM and also Zen in the vanilla form of Zen. Then, if you go a, a bit right in terms of the spectrum, you have these embedded hypervisors with somehow a reasonable code base, typically in the hundreds of case. Uh, they provide some sort of soft real-time guarantees. They have this possibility of running or scheduling uh, different uh, or multiple virtual CPUs atop one physical CPU, and they target generic embedded uh, applications without not these strict uh, real-time guarantees. We are talking about, for example, Xvisor or Acorn. Then we have these microkernel uh, kind of hypervisors. They typically resort to the use of capabilities, of this concept of software capabilities, uh, because they implement just a minimal set of service on the on the IS privilege level, and they defer uh, the remaining uh, part of the service, as well as device drivers to user uh, space, and they have these user level VMMs, and most of them, some of them are formally verified, like for example, CL4 is the, the most well-known example, uh, but they have a trade-off in terms of performance, interrupt latency, because they run most of the components in user space, so they need to have a lot of uh, communication going on through the IS privilege layer. And they typically target mobile and dynamics criticality system. And on the right, completely right side of the spectrum, we have this trend towards these static partitioning hypervisors. The goal is to have a very teeny tiny small code base, typically in a few kilobytes of software lines of code. Uh, but the idea is to provide strong isolation and real-time guarantees, uh, and they mostly target mixed criticality and some sort of IoT applications with, with uh, strict real-time requirements. Uh, the only problem is typically on this kind of architecture, you have an efficient resource usage because you typically uh, partition all your system at, at design time. And yeah, the examples, uh, as we will discuss, is Bao, uh, JLAS, and this new variant of Zen called Zen DOM Zero Less. Well, a kind of motivation for this static partition virtualization, which in fact was mostly pioneered by the Quest 5 uh, from Richard West, but they just focus firstly on, uh, on x86, and then uh, this architecture starts getting some traction when JLAUS from, from Siemens uh, yeah, start to, to implement this architecture. Uh, the problem when we start BOW and just to, to, to go a bit forward is that uh, when you start BOW first, Zendom Zero Less architecture was still not there. And uh, we didn't appreciate much the fact that JLAUS, they have the reasons, uh, rely on Linux to basically boot and stage uh, the system. But uh, this can be uh, somehow a problem when you have uh, security and safety into perspective. Uh, and this architecture, yeah, has this static resource, uh, resource assignment with one-to-one -one virtual physical uh, CPU mapping, uh, no memory management uh, at runtime, uh, devices are typically passed through, and uh, it relies on as much as possible on the hardware virtualization support available in, in modern platforms. 
Yeah, and with that, we go to Bao. Uh, the name Bao was an inspiration uh, from the Chinese word Bao Hu, which means to protect. Back then, we had some Chinese students at our lab, so we got some sort of inspiration from them. And the Bao uh, started basically in 2019, when José started his PhD under my supervision. And um, yeah, in 2020, we, we first released the, the first version of the code open source. It's a type one static partitioning uh, that relies on this or implements the static partitioning architecture. And the focus is in mixed critical IoT system with strong real time and security requirements. And you have just the link and the log. Well, uh, as I said, it's a type 1 or bare metal, runs directly atop the hardware, uh, as this one-to-one -one virtual to physical mapping in terms of CPUs, a static, completely static memory assignment, device pass-through, hardware interrupts. Uh, it provides a minimal layer of inter-VM communication, mostly uh, based on top shared memory and a few notifications, but it doesn't have any sort of dependency on any operating system, any external libraries, uh, and any uh, privileged virtual machines or operating systems. It relies as much as possible on the hardware virtualization support. Back then, uh, we started targeting uh, the ARM V8 architecture because the support for virtualization was quite uh, good. Uh, yeah, and in the different uh, flavors of this, uh, this support, either on the, on the CPU with this uh, second stage translation on the memory management unit, or in the interrupt virtualization support uh, in available on the most modern geek generic interrupt controllers from ARM, or in the IO MMU that in ARMS is uh, system MMU. It provides some sort of internal isolation, just uh, for security. It also implements super page. This is quite important in terms of if you want to achieve a very low performance overhead. I will explain in a second. Uh, and from we have implemented from scratch some techniques uh, for uh, to address this freedom from interference or to provide real uh, temporal and spatial isolation at the micro architectural level, not only at the arch architectural level. I'm sure you have heard about uh, Spectre, for example, Spectre leveraged the these uh, timing uh, channels uh, on the micro architecture for security, but you can see on the opposite side the same problem for safety or real time, where you can basically tamper with the cache access to basically uh, force, for example, one real time operating system to take more time to perform a specific task. Well, here we have two important takeaways from Bow. First one is the reduced performance overhead. Graph on top, there are two bars. This is the benchmark, my bench, automotive benchmark, an open source benchmark, uh, automotive suite. Uh, on the orange bars, we have when we configured BAU with super page support, two megabyte of pages. And as you can see, the performance overhead in this case is always below 0.5%. This is the cost that we need to pay for virtualization when you have the super page. You may wonder what means the other bars in uh, green. In green is when you don't use super page, but you use the finest page granularity, which is 4K. Uh, sometimes you need, for example, when you implement techniques like, like uh, as cache coloring to reduce interference, but because you have uh, to go through all the stages of the page tables, you incur in a much higher performance overhead. In this case, the maximum is, is 5%. But the takeaway is when you use super page, uh, the penalty is negligible. On the bottom, we have, which is typically the average trusted computing base or, or code base of BAU, as you can see below 10K. Uh, it quite depends if, you, as you will see, we have now ARM V8, ARM V7, but we, have, we also have RISC V, so it depends. It's architectural dependent, but on average is 8K software lines of code. And this was one of our goals, to keep it as simple and as small as possible because of potential uh, safety-related certifications. 
And yeah, uh, as I said, we have implemented from scratch this cache partitioning uh, technique, which is very good for safety in terms of guaranteeing this freedom of interference, but also for security. As I said, there is al always this dual perspective, safety versus security. And for security, as you can see, this is um, a neat map that we measured. Uh, on the top, we have what is the channel is this sort of channel that attacks like Spectre uh, leverage to, to recover secrets. Uh, is a timing channel. And when we apply this cache coloring technique that is effective for uh, safety, we also completely eliminate the channel. That is the image below. So this is real experiments with, uh, with BAO with this cache partitioning uh, technique. Well. Uh, over the last three years, we have um, included a lot of support uh, for BAL, uh, both in ARM v8 uh, and ARM v7 as well, A, eh? uh, uh, but also we have a strongly bet in, in, in RISC V. Uh, we have a lot of different uh, platforms. Uh, Jose will explain when we go to the demo part. Uh, but we have major platforms from major silicon manufacturers in the different uh, architectures. We don't have uh, support at the, mond uh, the moment for silicon for RISC V because it doesn't exist. But we have uh, built like uh, we have extended RISC V cores with hardware virtualization support. So we support all of those platforms as well. And uh, Quite important also, we also support Kimo, either for ARM and, and RISC V, and also the ARM FVP model. So, which means that you have no excuse if you want to try, you can basically, uh, without spending a single cent on a hardware platform, you can go grab the code and, and try by yourself. And we also, of course, support the Raspberry Pi uh, for platform. But these days it's quite difficult to get them, but yeah, they were quite cheap, and I hope we get more platforms. We, are, we also uh, support the different firmwares, either from ARM, the TF. A and also the open SVI from RISC V, and uh, yeah, different guest operating systems that we run on top of either Linux, Android, uh, RTOS like uh, Zephyr. Uh, we, uh, actually, we will demonstrate the demo with Zephyr, but also FreeRTOS and Eric. Eric is an automotive centric, AutoSA compliant uh, operating system. Well, and uh, just to stage, uh, just to get the stage for uh, for Jose, uh, yeah, we, we start first on the um, on the application class of processors. But the whole idea since the beginning was to create a very small uh, code base that also would be possible to 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 to, to have BAO running on these idly available microcontrollers or real-time processors. And uh, a quite interesting trend over the, the last few years in the industry is this inclusion of hardware virtualization support as well in these uh, real-time microcontrollers. ARM has this uh, Cortex-R52, uh, also the 82, uh, but Renaissance has this uh, RH850 with virtualization support, and Infineon, a quite important player in the automotive industry in, in Europe, uh, also decide to include uh, hardware virtualization support in the Aurix Tricord, the new one, the TC4. Uh, so that's why uh, we felt it was a very interesting niche to explore with BAO, uh, and that's why we implemented, uh, we started for the Cortex R52. And now I and it over to Jose. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. So now for the bit more technical part of the talk, I'll talk about the, the challenges we had when porting BAO to this Cortex-R architecture. And I'll start with the main difference between the Cortex-R and the Cortex-A architecture. So the first difference is that if you are familiar with uh, Cortex-A, ARM V8A, you have all these privilege modes uh, on top of uh, the user, supervisor, hypervisor, you will have the secure monitor on trust zone and on the, se and the secure world you will also have the hypervisor, the trusted OS and the trusted applications. On this Cortex-R cores and specifically on the Cortex for the 32-bit version that we will be addressing today, you only have the hypervisor, uh, supervisor and user modes so that there's no trust zone here, there's no secure world. The second the main difference is that while on Cortex-A uh, uh, processors you have the traditional MMU, 
which brings the translation and protection with a lot of flexibility on how the way you allocate more memory, on the way you lay out memory, etc. On uh, Cortex R um, CPUs, you only have uh, the MPU that you'll find also on the lower end uh, uh, Cortex M line, and you have of course the protection, but you the fact that you don't have this translation of the page tables, these implicit accesses to memory by the CPU, you'll have more predictability, which is the whole point of this architecture. And on the hardware side mainly, I, I believe this brings a lot more simplicity. On the software side, it's kind of debatable. So the Cortex-R52 or the Cortex, uh, the ARM V8R architecture has this MPU which implements this PMSA protected memory system architecture instead of the virtual memory system architecture which essentially all the logical addresses are physical addresses so we have a flat identity mapping always and uh, uh, the, the innovation in this new line of processors from ARM is that you will have a uh, virtualization supports so you'll have a dual stage MPU. You'll have a, a, a second stage MPU that is managed by the hypervisor, and you'll have a, a first stage MPU that's managed by the, the OS, the guest, whatever. So the Cortex R52 acts on the whole uh, 4 gigabyte uh, physical memory space. And uh, I'll, I'll come into, in the, I believe in the next slide I have more details, but you have. Uh, a number of uh, protection memory regions where you establish the base and the limit of the address is that uh, someone can access, the, the software can access, so it's a, a white list and you have access permission, memory access attributes and uh, a few important points is that these entries have to have a granularity of 64 bytes, must be aligned to 64 bytes and cannot overlap. You cannot have two entries overlapping in, in the MPU that will generate an exception. Also. Although architecturally there is a maximum of 255 of these MPU entries that you can have, which I believe would be more than enough, in the actual implementations in the Cortex-R52 uh, you'll have a lot less, so you'll have up to 24 in the, the physical cores that we saw on the real platforms that we saw, you had about one of them had 20, the other had 24. And you have a, a number of these hypervisor specific registers to manage these MPU entries. So another particularity of this MPU is that, so these are the what Harm calls the translation regimes. Uh, so on your leftmost side, you have the translation regime for the hypervisor itself. And this second stage, the hypervisor EL2 uh, MPU will kind of uh, control the access from the hypervisor itself and then this same MPU will control the accesses from the guest. So the entries are shared between the, the hypervisor and the, what the guest can see. So you don't have, in Cortex-A, you will have completely separate page tables, one for the hypervisor and for the guest. Uh, this is not the case. So you'll have a single MPU for both uh, privilege levels. And here on the MPU entries, you can uh, control what is called a ARM calls the shareability uh, of the region, which mainly tells the processor, so on which set of cores do you want to, the coherency, the cache coherency to act, and also has a few implications on the memory model, so things like the, the barriers and stuff like that. Uh, we'll see in a few slides, this was a problem for us in this port. So also the, the permissions, so, and here, uh, an important point is that when you give access to a guest, you also have to give access to the hypervisor. So you, you can't have the guest see something that the hypervisor can't see, and the same is true for execution. So if you give execution privilege to a guest, you also ha give execution privilege to the hypervisor, which might be a problem um, in, in, in a, from a security perspective. And on top of that, you'll have the memory attributes that uh, define the memory is reachable basically as cacheable or non-cacheable and stuff like that. So now for the port itself, the first issue we ran to when porting BAU to this, which was specifically designed to use an MMU to this MPU architecture, was the issues with the memory layout. So BAU relied a lot on the MMU to have, for example, 
a statically linked, so we always linked BAO on the same addresses for a given architecture. We used, uh, we ha the, used extensively the MMU to kind of limit the access to the hypervisor following this least privilege principle so that it, it will only access to what it, it really need to as much as we could. And we did a, a lot of aliasing using the MMU on the memory space. And this created a, a quite uh, fragmented uh, address space. So another point is that we also, for example, included the guest images in the hypervisor binary itself, which kind of so that we could have like a compressed binary, we had to separate the on the physical memory layout, which you see on your left. You had to separate the uh, BSS regions from the the data regions from the loadable regions of the hypervisor, and we also used the slab allocator that at runtime allocated some stuff for the hypervisor, some objects mainly for the CPUs to communicate, we, which created an even more sparse address space. And the main issue here is that we do have a limited number of MPU entries, which are shared between the hypervisor and the guest, as I said before. And this is an issue because we can quickly run out of them if you want to have a, a, a kind of arbitrary uh, address space w when configuring your guest. And so also the, the, the issue that I said before regarding the permission, so we, we, you, you have to share the permissions, which is not great. For example, in the, in the MMU, we can have parts of the image being execute only or read only, only parts being uh, uh, read and write. And here, for that, we'll have to use a lot of MPU entries. So this was a problem for her. And also, we, we use, different, use different MPU entries to restrict what CPUs can see from the per per CPU, I guess that's what's called uh, structures that the other CPU use. We limit that. And uh, this was not scalable at all when we, increase, when we increase the number of cores. So here is a, a toy example, but on the rightmost side, you can see that the hypervisor is using already, I don't know, five, six MPU entries. And this is just a toy example. So in reality, if we did a naive um, translation from our memory layout from the Cortex-A to the Cortex-R, we would be using more than half of the MPU entries that are available on the Cortex-R cores. So what we did for this was the first uh, is the fact that so it's an identity mapping. So we, 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 we didn't want to use the position independent code, so we did provide a way to compile the hypervisor to wherever you want. So it's a configurable base address for the image and restructure the layout so, so that we can have this, have all, all these structures that I, I, I talked about in the previous slide, we can have them really contiguous and we, we kind of leverage the fact that this hypervisor is statically and did a lot of more things during compile time. So like we have only one region for the image, then we only have a region for the CPU, one region for the VM that that CPU is, is running. And uh, and we also have to use a couple of entries for the, for the console, for the UART and the interrupt controller. So right now we use five of these MPU entries independently of what platform you run. So it's more scalable. We, we like to use less, but th that's what we came up with. So next, how, how we manage uh, memory here. So the original BAO memory management uh, model was based on the, um, had uh, on the page granularity. So four cages, it was fixed. And uh, we had this simple interface where you kind of allocate physical pages, allocate uh, virtual address space, and map them. So we want to maintain the, main, ma the, the same model, essentially, so don't, we don't have to change the core of the hypervisor a lot. And what we did was we allowed this size of the page to be configurable. So we configure it to the MPU granularity, but you can kind of configure it to be more. Uh, and add an extra wrapper on this memory management interfa interface so that you kind of merge the physical and the uh, virtual allocation. You do, you do it in one step and uh, the Cortex-A part separates them, but the Cortex-R part does just one step and verifies that, okay, you are trying to map, it's an identity mapping, so it's valid. And then we uh, kind of separated the MPU management in two layers. First, what you call a virtual MMU, which, uh, 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 sorry, a, a virtual MPU, which kind of uh, architecture agnostic, and we have one per address space, the same way you would have uh, one, um, the same way you would have one 
page table per, per address space, and then a, a physical uh, layer, and kind of the the each uh, virtual MPU is managed independently of the physical MPU, and each core locally maps multiple virtual M uh, MPUs to the physical MPU that it has. So there are a couple of problems with this. The first, the fact that you don't, if you change one mapping locally, you have to tell the other cores that you change it. You have to do a kind of broadcast. The fact that the, the number of virtual MPU entries might be uh, larger than the physical available when they kind of have a mechanisms to manage that and configure that. And also the fact that we have this non-overlapping regions that must share the permissions between the guest and the hypervisor. So it really complicates a lot. So we can guarantee that you are giving the minimum permissions possible to each one. So next, I'll try to be quick because we're running out of time. But uh, the next step was interrupt injection. And if you're familiar with the how interrupts work on the ARM architecture, you have this uh, distributor that receives the interrupts from the peripherals. And then this, this distributor forwards, according to some configurations, forwards the interrupts to the, to the interfaces. And uh, the interfaces decides that if you'll forward or not the, the interrupt to the, the CPU. And uh, you have virtualization support that works out of the box in the Cortex R. And uh, what, what happens is that the hypervisor has to fully emulate this distributor part, and then the software has uh, the hardware has support so that the hypervisor can inject into hubs in a virtual uh, CPU interface. And the ARM architecture has two interrupt lines going to the, the processor. One is called the IRQ, that's used by all hypervisors right now, and the other one is called FIQ, that's typically reserved for trust zone, for the secure world. But our observation here was the fact that, so there's no trust zone here. We looked at the hardware and so, so we have the same thing. So we have two interrupt lines. We can assign one to the hypervisor and one to the guest. So the, just a small point uh, in this. In this previous slide, small point here is that the fact that the hypervisor has to receive all interrupts and inject them in the guest to the virtual interface, it really increases the lot of the interrupt latency, which is a, one of the goals is, of these hypervisors is to reduce this kind of stuff. So real time, we want to have real load latency, deterministic latencies. So what we did here basically was to, okay, let's give the IRQ line to the guest and the hypervisor will have the FAQ line. You still emulate the distributor, you still control which interrupt lines the guest has access to, but you really have a complete direct injection from the hardware to, to the guest without the hypervisor losing anything. So the hypervisor still has its own interrupts, it still has full control of the interrupt controller, and you have native latency when injecting the interrupts. So there are also a few issues. The fact that we don't have a EL3, there's no standard trusted firmware for this course. We have to do a lot of work for managing the platform itself. So low level setup, like lock setup, power management, stuff like that. You will have to do this. If for, and for BAO, that's a problem because BAO does rely on the trusted firmware for, for these low level um, operations on the Cortex-A. And now we have to include platform specific code, which is something that we, we didn't have until now. So a last point regarding the core is when, so most of the port we did using the ARM FVP models, which basically give you a, model, um, a platform model essentially equal to the Cortex-A core. So the platform model is the same, but when you go to the real platforms, you, you, ha you can use the real course, you, you have a slightly different thing. It's more akin to what you find in, in MCU platforms than, than what you find in application platforms. So the first thing we did, we had to do uh, some initialization code to move to move data from flash to the SRAMs and uh, uh, change the, the way the hypervisor is linked to allow this. We also have some issues with the Cortex-R related to the shareability domain. So the main issue is that the Cortex R52, each core, although the vendors provide clusters of cores, each core is its own shareability domain, which means that sharing things in the cache and uh, things like spin locks that rely on the fact that these cores are on the same shareability domain don't work correctly. The main, the, the only thing that we had to do, but we're still looking if we find more issues because our spin log started acting uh, really erratic, 
is that we have to configure the all hypervisor as being uh, all hypervisor regions as part of the outer cacheability domain. In this way, all the the instructions like the, with the store release semantics will act on the further caches, not on the inner caches of the the core. So th there are also some core specific registers that uh, for the Cortex R implementation that we didn't have to manage in other cores and that we have to manage on this core to give a, a guests access to some private core peripherals. So and that's pretty much it. I will try to do a brief demo uh, of this running on the FVP uh, platforms. So we have this repo repo uh, on the on github that has a lot of them a lot of them four demos but that can run on almost uh, any of the platforms that we support so you will have the demo running linux the demo running freearch os zephyr and of course on this course we don't run linux i don't know if it is possible but we don't and uh, right now we'll show you how to run this uh, zephyr plus a bare metal application on the fpr 32-bit uh, core so essentially, what you have to do when you clone this repo is just run this. I don't know if you can see it. So let me try to. Yeah. Essentially, you, you just have to set up some environment variables, tell it which con cross compiler you want to use, which platform you want to use, which demo you, you want to run. So we want to run the FPPR, we want to run Zephyr and bare metal. And um, you run this. Just a make command, we have a few make files that automate, fetch the hypervisor, the guest, apply a few patches, the configuration, build it. So I already did this beforehand, so, but you will have to wait a few minutes here. And then for the, for the models that can run on a computer, you just can make run, and then the model will start. And here we have, so we have uh, assigned a, a new art console to one of the guests, another new art console to the other. You have the bare metal application running right here. It's running two cores with receiving some interrupts. You can send it more interrupts from the, from the characters. And you have a simple console application for Zephyr that allows you to communicate with the other guests. So you can write, uh, you have this Bowie PC command that tells it to wait. Can, can you write notify? Yeah. And just tell. So, and you can send a message to the parameter, so the parameter will receive uh, an interrupt uh, from the, the Zephyr that emitted an hyper call to the hypervisor to tell it they send an interrupt to the other guest. We received the interrupt and printed what it said, and also. Each time the bare metal application is, uh, receives one of these character interrupts, it will write on a shared memory region, and you can read this shared memory region from the Zephyr side. And you tell, okay, I received this number of interrupts. So it's a really simple demo, but demonstrates the base concept of having the two segregated guests. Each runs on separate cores and can communicate with each other. And you can try as of today. Yeah, so you can just download it and run it. I don't think this mic is working, so I will continue with this one. So yeah, the demo was on uh, on the FVP model. You can try out of the box for other platforms. You can try also on Kimu. Uh, but most most interesting is that uh, this is one of the few uh, Cortex R52 uh, compliant platforms available, not yet for public on the market, still pre-production, but thank you NXP and thank you Brad for this uh, loan of this platform. We have it on our lab. This is the S32Z270. Uh, uh, um, and yeah, we also have uh, the very same demo, uh, which means we have the port of BAL for this real hardware platform as of today, and we, have, we also have this Zephyr Plus bare metal uh, system also running on, on this uh, platform. Uh, as of today with the Lauterbach tools, but um, soon uh, out of the box from a Flash or SD card. Well, just to conclude, so uh, yeah, we have demonstrated that uh, we have completed the architectural port of uh, BAU hypervisor for uh, this um, R32R uh, architecture, Cortex R52. I think this is working, yeah. Uh, but 
uh, we also in, in in the meantime we have also implemented the R54 R uh, support, which means is a variant, uh, for example, the Cortex R82, where you can have, for example, on the bottom layer an MPU, but on top an MMU, which means that you can basically, from an hypervisor point of view, have this determinism of predictability granted by the MPU, but on top you can li run Linux comply uh, general purpose operating systems like Linux uh, out of the box and we have also a demo with uh, Linux and, and, and Zephyr for this uh, platform on GitHub you can go to the bow demos and you can try by yourself well as I said before uh, we, al we also have work in progress on real hardware platforms the only one that is that you can buy publicly is this Renaissance one uh, and we also have this port for this uh, um, NXP uh, that I, I, I talked before. Uh, there are a few open issues on, on real uh, hardware platforms. Uh, at the system level, they have uh, custom uh, SMPUs, system MPUs. Uh, if you are familiar with uh, application processors, you have these standardized uh, S system MMU uh, that is quite the same once they follow, like the once they are implement the IP compliant with the specification. Here, what we have seen is a lot of heterogeneity, which means that you need to to perform uh, or to implement a different support each time you get a new uh, hardware uh, platform uh, that requires implementation of drivers. Uh, also, the, this coherence problem uh, under the, the clusters and the cache partitioning. Uh, and uh, we, all, we are also exploring, uh, that's why when, we, when Jose was, was explaining, we implement this virtual MPU on the top and the physical uh, MPU on the bottom, is because we want to reuse the same, the same uh, technology for other uh, architectures. Uh, and in particular, we are already ex ex exploring with a, uh, a company that is building a RISC V uh, SOC, uh, a similar architecture uh, for RISC V, uh, like uh, com similar to the Cortex R52, but in, in RISC V. And also, uh, we are starting uh, with our X uh, TC4 uh, as well, the port. So that's all for today. A few pointers if you want to follow Bao on, on different social uh, media channels. And uh, yeah, we are open to address all, all your questions. So no questions? I think we are. Yeah, we need to repeat. Uh, otherwise, yeah, you can go. Thank you. Um, is it working? Um, is there a way uh, today with uh, on the Air 52 version to prevent against against uh, DMR access from a guest that would allow it to circumvent isolation provided by the MPU? Yeah, the, the, the question is about uh, prevention, uh, prevention of DMA uh, triggered attacks because they are at the system platform level, not at the core level, and the MPU is at the core level. For this case, as I said, in real platforms, you have this uh, SMPU, system MPU. Uh, different uh, silicon manufacturers has different implementations with different capabilities. Uh, I can comment on the NXP because uh, is the one that we have implemented. We have seen also for NSS, uh, for the ST, they have it, but we don't want to comment on that for now. But for NXP, you have what is called a resource domain controller. It's a kind of, yeah, you know, for the Cortex-A, they have, yeah, a minimalistic implementation on, on this sort of course. And, uh, yeah, it allows you basically to, con to, to enforce isolation at a platform level. And this is case to avoid any DMA-like uh, device to trigger any sort of uh, security attack or whatever it is. Thank you. So if there's no more questions, thank you all for coming. Uh, yeah, and uh, feel free to try Bow and provide your feedback or, or comments everyone, every time you want. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.